Today, I'm gonna to talk about six steps to mastering any subject, and I'm gonna use English as the example throughout. Now, this idea came to me because of all the people who've written me and told me about how they're stuck at a certain level, unable to make progress. And so this video is for you all and for all of those interested in bettering their skills. This live applies to beginners, to advanced, to experts in English, in any field that you happen to be studying, math, sciences, it doesn't matter. The skills and steps I'm gonna talk about are transferable. So I feel this is why this is a very important video for everyone. What's the goal of the live? To provide a path for all learners of all levels, of all subjects, to improve along. <clears throat> I'm certain that some of you or many, most of you know some of these steps, but I think very few know all of them. And that's why I think this is important. So let's start right away. Step one, <clears throat> study it. This is the most elementary level. If you want to learn about something, read about it, study it. This I think is clear to everybody. And for most students, it's something you have to do because your teachers tell you you have to do it. As you get older, or maybe you have developed a passion for a particular subject, you study it because you want to do it. And so there are different ways of studying, one because you have to <laughs> or because um, you want to. These are different distinctions, but the, the, it remains the same that you have to study the subject. Step number two, <clears throat> recognize it. So now this is the next level of understanding the topic, and you'll see the barometer on the right, the battery, where you start to understand it to higher levels. So what's the key idea here? Well, first of all, the context is that you've been given homework and that you can do the homework. So you're recognizing how to fulfill the task or skill. So if I'm studying present perfect, then the teacher gives me sentences that address present perfect and I'm able to answer those questions or identify which one, which verb is correct. That is to recognize it. That's step two in this process. Recognizing correct examples is good, but not proof that you have internalized the subject yet. That will happen in step three. But step two is important as it breaks the ice. It moves from passive reading about it. Now you become a little bit more active by answering questions or doing exercises. But step three is the most active part of the learning part of this, sort of the learner's uh, uh, process. So here we go. Step three, provide your own examples. Now here we move from doing exercises in the book or online as homework to now creating our own sentences. And this is where you really understand how well you know it. Can I write, for example, different sentences using present perfect? Can I write it correctly? This is a really big test. This step also begins to weed out those who are lazy because this requires the most effort. Studying it, doing exercises, you're more active, but actually creating your own sentences is the most active. And it requires energy, it requires thought. And so it weeds out the lazy learners. Weed out, to weed out someone or something is a phrasal verb that means you begin to, <clears throat> you, you begin to exclude, they, you don't exclude them, but they exclude themselves. This is called a weeding out process. And there are fewer and fewer people that move to step three because it's more effort. This is a great, um, step three is a great measurement or point to ask yourself, do I know the topic well? And you just simply create an example and not look at the book. Don't copy the book, don't use the book. Create your own example. If you're not able to do it, 
that's fine. Then move back to step two and keep studying until you're able to advance to step three. This is a very important step for the learner. And we're about to move to step four for everyone, including the teacher. Are you ready? Step four, as we start to master any subject. And again, these examples, I've, I'm using English, but this can be any subject that we're talking about. Mechanics, physics, any subject. Your ability to produce something on your own is proof that you're able to understand it to a higher degree than just doing the homework. Now here's the step where it starts to get interesting. And again, fewer people are gonna go through this, is your ability to teach the subject is further proof of your mastery of the subject. What if I'm not a teacher? I know that many of you are saying, I'm not a teacher, I'm not interested in being a teacher, and that's not relevant. That's not my point. You can teach anybody. You can teach your friends. You can teach a mirror. You can teach your, if you have a dog at home or a cat, you can teach them. The point is you need to practice teaching it. Your ability to teach something is another degree higher of your, or, or sort of proof of your knowledge or mastery of the subject. Now, let me tell you what's beautiful about trying to teach it. And for all teachers, you will understand this. The minute you begin to prepare teaching, you quickly understand the areas you know well within the subject and the areas that you're not sure about, that you have to then check on. And this is really valuable knowledge. It's these areas that you're unsure about, that you're not quite sure, is this right or is it wrong? Or it's these areas that you then can address to become more proficient. So I get a lot of questions about Professor Corton, how can I learn faster? Now, I'm not a big fan of shortcuts, but this is legitimately the fastest way to learn. Identifying the areas in the subject that you're weakest at and then addressing them specifically and head, head on. Don't shy away. Don't say, oh, I'm not good enough because I don't know these areas very well. Everyone experiences this. Even the best teachers at your university, at your school, they've all experienced this. So if you feel inadequate, if you feel woefully under <laughs> sort of prepared, you will then understand what a teacher feels like, especially in the early stages of their career. So feeling inadequate is not an excuse to quit. It's a barometer that's showing you where you can learn the fastest. It shows you the most immediate needs. So instead of looking at this negatively, I think you need to look at it positively. If you want to learn quickly, address these areas that you feel insecure about as you're preparing to teach. So there is nothing holding anyone back from doing this. Even if you're 10 years old, 16 years old, or 80 years old, you can, you can call up a friend or you can call, if you have a brother or sister and say, listen, I, and, you know, if they'll take you seriously, say, I would like to give me 10 minutes. I want to try to teach this. No one is holding you back from a teaching opportunity. And for those who are studying to be teachers, call up a teacher friend, ask to volunteer for 10 minutes on a Zoom chat, because all teachers would love a little bit of help with their Zoom lessons, ask to volunteer for 15 minutes. Show them the presentation that you're gonna make and say, can I teach this for 15 minutes? This is the best experience you can get as a learner because it shows you, it identifies where the weak areas are. This will not be done. Most people will never do this because it takes effort, it's a little bit painful, it's uncomfortable to be uncomfortable or to feel like you don't know enough. This is not a natural, comfortable position. But these are moments, I believe, where you learn the most, provided that you have prepared appropriately. 
And that's important. I'm not saying teach unprepared because you're not going to learn much about that except that you shouldn't do it again. <laughs> but what you can do is offer to teach. You do not need to be a teacher to, to practice step four. I can't emphasize enough how important step four is on the road to mastering a subject. Again, very few people will take this step, but I contend it's perhaps the most important step that you can take on this path. It's more important than step three, because whereas in step three, you're creating something on your own. In step four, you have to verbalize it. And the move from creating something, writing it down, to actually verbalizing it externally to other people is very different. And it's a big step. It doesn't seem like a lot, but it's a very big step. And once you begin to get comfortable with being uncomfortable, with being in this learning mode, this is when life and learning gets exciting because nothing can stop you. Being, feeling inadequate is, you need to understand it's okay when you're learning new subjects. And that if you want to learn the fastest, step three and step four are paramount. Paramount is a great synonym for important. P-A-R-A-M-O-U-N-T, paramount. These two steps are of paramount importance. That's how you collocate it um, as an adjective or a noun. You can use it. All right. Now there are two more steps. And these two steps I would suggest are the two steps that very few people consider. Step five is a step almost no one considers, even teachers, unfortunately. Are you ready for step five? Step five, I feel, is a game changer at the highest level. It's a game changer when you're over 80 to 90% mastery. Are you ready for step five? Here it is. <clears throat> Answer questions on it. So you're teaching, that's great, but then fielding difficult questions. Now, I'm not talking about any question on the topic. I'm talking about intelligent, thoughtful, questions on the topic. Making yourself vulnerable. Why is step five so critical to mastering at the highest level these topics? The, any subject, any subject, physics, literature, math, science, it doesn't matter. Any subject. Because you're now fielding questions from intelligent people who are seeing the same subject you are from perspectives you've not considered. Now, let me tell you why this step is so difficult for most people. Because nobody wants to look stupid in front of peers or in front of an audience. I understand that. We don't want to be embarrassed by saying the three words or four words, three words, I don't know. But first of all, it's okay not to know. That's the first thing. And secondly, if you can overcome or push aside these fears or uncomfortable moments, you can then open up a whole new world of learning. Because even if the question is a little bit critical of you, it doesn't matter. You are getting so much valuable information. Even if the intentions of the questioner are wrong, you can benefit so much from this because you're now seeing your topic from perspectives you've not considered that you need to consider. And so if you can't answer them there, and if you can't, that's great because these for me represent learning moments that I go home and then I find answers to them. And guess what? The next time I talk on this subject, there will be fewer questions that I'm not ready for. That's how you become a master in a subject. So, if you can't answer a question, it's okay, admit it. But remember, this represents, that good question represents a, your homework as a teacher or as an expert. This is now your homework when you go home. So we all have homework, not just students. If you're a student of your subject, a student for life, as I feel I try to be, then you, you look at these opportunities, you look at these good questions, and you relish 
in these moments. Relish is to enjoy because you realize as you get older, you don't have teachers directly as you did as a student. And so good questions act as many teachers in your path to learning. So I would suggest that you embrace difficult questions. You don't have to answer them completely, or you might not know the answers, but this becomes your homework for later. This is a beautiful moment that very few people understand. Now, if you're inviting your friends, it's just a practical example. In the first example, in step four, when you're teaching, you can invite anybody. But if you want to practice step five, you have to invite only your smart friends because they're, they're going to ask better questions. And this is where step five is important. You want people to challenge you because when you're challenged, that's when you become certain about what you believe and what you don't. This is a very, very important step, but it's a step that very few people, and I'm talking not just students, I'm talking now professors, my colleagues, very few people like to be challenged because most people are used to being right. And that is unfortunate because no one's ever right all the time. And so if you can stay in the student mentality, even if you're near an expert, this is the key to always growing, and it's also the key to not being frustrated by not knowing a particular question. So this is step five is really important. After teaching or during teaching, listen carefully for the good questions. These represent learning moments at home, your homework. I hope you've understood that. Now, the sixth step, which I believe is well, this is, the, the, I think, the final step in the mastery of a subject is to reinvent the topic. Reinvent the topic means that now you understand it so well that you can put it in your own words. You don't have to borrow what the book says. You now package that topic, that subject, present perfect. You package it in a way that's your own, that people identify with you. Now, we have to be careful that we're not so novel, so new, that we move from the core principles of the subject. In other words, we don't want to teach something erroneously or that's not correct. But within the core principles of any subject, if you can teach it in a way that is your own perspective or what you feel is important, that is the true mastery of the subject, to reinvent it or repackage it or say it in a way that very few people have perhaps heard in the past. And this is important. And I want to tell you that this is the challenge that I place to myself on every Instagram post. And I want to give you a few examples of how I do that to let you know that I'm also trying step six. I fail sometimes. It's not so creative, but other times maybe it is. So we're all in the process of experimenting. And let me tell you something about st step six. You don't get better at creating your own, you know, thoughts on the subject unless you experiment. And when you experiment, that means you fail sometimes. But that's the process of learning. Failure is a process. It's a marker that lets you know, okay, that doesn't work, but maybe this might. So here's how I've tried to reinvent common subjects in English in an uncommon way. So one, one thing I've tried to do is my Instagram has grown is to appeal to the beginner to, from the beginner to the advanced. This is no small feat. In other words, no small feat means this is difficult. So what I've tried to do, and I think very creatively in some ways, because I haven't seen it done very often, certainly not on Instagram, is that I provide certain topics like writing description or spelling, I provide it at various levels from beginner or pre-intermediate all the way to advanced. And so in this way, I can capture the attention of many different levels of learners on one common topic. So this is a way that I've tried to reinvent common topics and package it in a way that creatively attracts the attention of many levels of learners. 
Whether it's been successful or not, I'll let you decide that. But that's been my attempt. And finally, in terms of content, I've tried to do the same. So for example, recently I produced the video as usually, which is an error. Um, as usual, I just, um, I just remembered that I wanted to do another one. I wanted to talk about adverbs and I didn't put it up here. Sorry about that. The position of adverbs. I recently posted that. And what's interesting about that position of adverbs is that I've discussed it in a way that very, you don't hear very often. I, I discussed it in a way that how do you position the adverb in relation to the verb with a single verb, a double verb, and a triple verb or a compound verb. And I think this is very interesting because this is not often how you address the topic of adverbs. So I think it was interesting in that approach. I'm sorry, I had the wrong, I have the wrong profile pic. Good style. I've approached in, I think, a very interesting way. Uh, earlier on, I did a, um, um, a video on good style, and I approached it very, I simplified it, and I said that good style basically means it's clearly understood, and it's written or spoken in a natural English style. So in that way, I haven't reinvented it, but I've packaged it in a way that's simple for everyone to understand, and that you don't often hear. And then finally, everyone wants to learn about vocabulary and there's always learning vocabulary in context. What I've tried to do here is package three words around a common theme. And in my last one, I did something about being busy where I even did another level of, you know, tying it in with water and being, you know, in over your head with water or snow or something over your head. So I've tried to teach vocabulary in an interesting and perhaps sort of a unique way. And so I'm also trying to implement the same steps that I'm suggesting you should implement. So let's just review. To review these steps, you study it, you do it, the homework, you create it on your own, you teach it, and then you teach it and field very good questions. And then finally, you reinvent it. And these, I believe, are the stages or the processes of learning any subject. And you can understand where you're at in this field of any subject you're studying based on this chart. I think it's very helpful. And I think that you can benefit from it if you keep this in mind. I want to just end with this key ideas. If you teach something, you know it well. That's very important. Steps three and four, I think for most of us, are very important, especially step three. And then for some of us really motivated, step four. And then finally, the higher you get, the more proficient you become, the smaller the improvement. But don't get frustrated. It just means that you're closer to the top. I hope that helps and I hope that it's very encouraging to all of you. I'm gonna field a few questions, but I just want to say for those who came late, if you want to hear this video again or share it with a friend, I'm gonna upload it to YouTube at the conclusion of this live. Let's look at a few questions. Hello, everybody. Yes, I have it. All right, this is a very good question. How to gain confidence and how not to care about unnecessary critics. Do you know from me the way I've overcome this? Because obviously as you grow on Instagram, you get a lot of criticism as well. Um, I don't worry. I don't know. Criticism is for me a motivation. <laughs> so I don't actually, first of all, I don't take it personally. I understand that people have their own issues and so I try not to judge people. But I just want to say this, you don't overcome or you don't care less about criticism until you start to receive a lot of it. So it's natural to get angry when you're criticized, especially if people criticize you unfairly. This is a natural human reaction. I'm gonna suggest that you don't worry about it and challenge yourself to get more criticisms and to react in a better way. So what I do 
uh, when I get critical remarks, and I get them almost every day, not a lot, I have to say, I have a very generous uh, following, so thank you for that. But a few times, um, I try to understand the truth in the criticism, because there's this saying that within any criticism, there's an element of truth in it. So the first thing I try to do after I relax, and for some of you, that relaxing period might take a, a week or a day. If you're new, you're angry, that's fine to be angry, but don't respond initially. Don't respond when you're angry. Wait, and then the next step is what in what with what is it within that unfair criticism that's actually true that I can learn from? So try to learn from it. And you know what I do to answer them? And I think it's I think it's helpful for both sides. I don't escalate the conflict. I'd never respond in a critical way, or I try not to. I address the truth within that unfair criticism, and it works really well. And two things happen. The Tension is diffused, that means there's no tension. And secondly, I've actually learned something. And thirdly, I've set a great example for that person about how to answer questions that they also know are probably unfair. And so you have three learning points on, both, on either side. But for you, it's a chance to learn, even with unfair criticisms. And through this, you gain confidence. This does not happen overnight. I've had many years of experience. And do you know, only recently, I've gotten good, I think, adequate maybe, at addressing criticism. Earlier, I didn't do it well because naturally we're defensive. We want to say, that's not right. You're wrong. But the mature approach is to rest, think, ponder about it, and try to find the elements of truth in it. Address those in a very calm, respectful manner to the person who addressed you perhaps in a very hostile manner, and then move on. Learn from it and move on. So even unfair criticisms are for me learning moments, either what I can learn about the subject or how to address people who might be more aggressive. It's a learning moment academically or intellectually and psychologically. So all of these moments are potentially interesting. All right. <clears throat> okay, I'm looking here. Thank you, Mahmoud. Thank you. Hello, Iraq. Iraq, nice to see you. Thank you, Yashanth. Yours. All right, I'm not seeing a lot of questions related. All right, we're going to just, I think we'll finish. Let's have a short one. Um, All right, I'm not seeing. All right, I think that's about it. If you have any questions that I haven't addressed, then please uh, write me in, a, in my inbox. I just want to say that um, this has been a, a really great um, 2020 for us, despite or in the midst of very difficult conditions. Um, I hope that we will learn more in 2021. And so I'd like just to take this opportunity to wish all of you season's greetings and a happy new year. And most importantly, stay safe. Thank you all and see you in 2021. Bye-bye.